carving it up yes. at the lake. Welcome, everybody, to the, uh, what is this? August, August 10th. 10th Administrative Committee meeting. Agendas have changed a little bit, so the numbers are in different places. Uh, to my right is Jim Boland. To my left is John Weber. To his left is Gary Reedner, City Supervisor, and I'm Dan Carscallen. First item of business is the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. You good with them, Jim? I'm good with that. It's been right. quite a while, but yeah. It's been a while. We'll call, them, we'll call those good. Uh, next up is the disbursement report for July. Don Palmer is going to present that to us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have the disbursements report for the month of July. Um, we have uh, expended one million nine hundred twenty-two thousand one hundred fifty-five dollars. Eighty-nine percent of the total re is represented of uh, payroll nine hundred and seventy-six thousand nine hundred and ten dollars. Professional services two hundred and sixty-two thousand six hundred and eighty-one dollars. Enough comment of that about that is one of the quarterly payments for Wicom. Uh, sanitation two hundred and thirty thousand four dollars. Contractual payments twenty four thousand one fifty three. Supplies thirty nine thousand three ninety nine. Construction fifty nine nine zero five. Um, utilities seventy five thousand four twenty four. Equipment twenty seven thousand six zero six. Uh, a lot of computers in that. Uh, twenty two thousand of it. Twenty three thousand of it. Improvements sixteen thousand nine hundred and seventy eight dollars and insurance six thousand eight hundred and fifty two dollars Which I believe is the uh, fire uh, co um, Liability insurance that we pay an annually in the month of July So of that that represents the 89 percent if you have any questions usually you're up in the 90 some percents with what you show Yeah, there's a lot of little stuff. I noticed that too. And so what we try to track is um, what we try to track is the major things, but there's not a lot of major things this time. It's a lot of little stuff. So, any questions, John? No, I'm good. All right, then we'll go ahead and consider those approved. Okay. And we'll move on to the fee resolution update. All right. Um, the fee resolution is a um, resolution that we pass every year. It's in preparation for the 2016 budget. The fee resolution will not take uh, effect until October 1. Uh, uh, according to the Idaho State Code, we anything that's a new fee or a fee that's above 5%, we have to advertise and have a public hearing on that public hearing is on the 17th next monday at city council uh and long followed with the uh the adoption of the budget for 2016 and then we're also going to have an amending um, budget for 2015 at that same uh, same date and just doing some extra advertising for you um the fee resolution um uh has a lot of fees that are not changed as well but we have to so it's a it's a compilation of the entire catalog of all the fees that we charge so with that I can just uh, kind of go through a narrative unless you want to get me get real specific but um, it includes land use development fees uh, a building va valuation change um, it's a pu publication that's done in the in the one of the publications that's that is the keystone to um, valuing properties uh, or value buildings for for uh, the building permit fee, non-compliance permit fees, engineering plan review fees, engineering legal review and agreement fees, utility rates increasing are based for water, sewer, and sanitation. Um, I should have wrote the notes for what the percentages were. I think it's 7.3 and 6 percent, and then the CPI adjustment of three. 1.8 I believe for sanitation um, then there's an additional fee for recycling services uh, that commences on October 1 and just the contractual adjustments other uh, fees include uh, street banner installation and removal fees uh, a pedicab and a carriage fees although that there was an ordinance that went through and that's a new fee. We do not have a service or a vendor that has You're just adding that under taxi cabs though, right? Correct. Um, per parade permits and security deposits for right-of-way ex excava excavation fees are also going up. 
Police escort fees are, are also planned to increase. New street closure fees are being proposed for events and parades. Other miscellaneous fees include alcohol for, uh, event permit fees and fiber optic service licenses fees. Any new programs for the Parks and Recreation Department, uh, those changes must be um, also part of the fee, fee resolution and also increases part of the, the public hearing. Uh, swimming pool passes, swimming pool admission fees, crop harvest fees, it's a new one, city park reservation and new park fees, and then um, finally farmer's market uh, and art, art walker going up uh, slightly based upon a recommendation by the committee. Uh, the fees, uh, uh, these fees are not, uh, are reflective of our cost of service. Um, we can't make a profit on any of those fees, so so that's uh, that's why we're going through this public hearing, and that's part of the statute as well. You have any specific questions? Go ahead, John. Um, so here on page 26, <coughs> it looks like uh, under K event street closures, all of these are new fees. So we're going to have to have a uh, hearing on those on Monday. Uh, yes. As part of the whole big. Yeah. Yes. Any new fees required to, to have this public hearing as well as any fee above 5%, and all those, you're right, are exact, are new okay. fees. Well, we do, we do them all together. We do it all together as part of the process. Um, I don't see a lot of anything that's really a 5%. Nothing really increased over five. Well, the sewer the did, and the water right. did. Right, but um, those were those were programs. Yeah, um, and and then the, there's a new fee of uh, mentioned in the sewer fund that's uh, brand new that I might draw your attention to. Um, we do not have a fee currently for RV parks, and that's a new fee. We, we've added that as well. We added the fee the, even though we don't have a park. We have an RV park max out at Southeast Sewer District. Oh, um, okay. But we didn't have a, uh, a um, we were charging them, I think, based on mobile home parks. Oh, and oh they, a sewer fee for it. So, yeah. And so the sewer fee changed to to have, to make it more susceptible for the vacancy rating that they have in an RV park that you wouldn't have in a mobile home park. So that's been a big change as well. And it's the only one in, in Moscow. So. And then you said that the uh, farmer's market fees... Yeah, five percent on that is what the recommendation was by the the farmers market committee. All right, I uh, I think that's way low, but that's I think apparently um, we've got a uh, Gary Gary can fill fill in, but I we um, Kathleen is tasked with doing a uh, economic study. Um, we're working with the University of Idaho on that. Um, that's Gary, the reason I'm only going to say on I think it's way low. You want to expand on that, Gary? No. Well, I think you've just done it. Uh, we're looking at the farmer's market. Kathleen and her staff have put together surveys and that sort of thing, which we'll then be turning over to an economist to take a look at. This is also will be the second year, but hopefully a more comprehensive year than last year where the vendors are reporting their uh, <coughs> revenues to the state tax commission. So hopefully as an aggregate, we'll be able to look at those and and better determine what the impact of the farmer's market is and hopefully make better informed decisions on what the rate should be. But we'll, we'll only really have part of a year in next year before this comes back up. We'll have all of this year. We'll have the data from We'll this have year. this year's data, but I'm talking, I guess fees really doesn't matter other than it. Well, and remember that you can change fees whenever you want. If it goes up, if it's new or, or is increased more than 5%, you just have to have a public hearing on it. So we could, the council could pass a fee resolution, rethink some of these later on, and change that again if the council so desired. We just have to have another public hearing. Okay. Jim, you got anything? No, I'm, I'm good with that. I don't see anything that was ridiculously increased or anything in there. So. The other thing also, um, we try to make that uh, more conducive to the timing. It's always been a timing issue. It seems like the Farmers Market Commission meets in March, and we're at about the same time we're putting the budget together, right. and we're slammed with trying to put the budget together, and then Farmers Market Analysis comes through, and it's just, uh, you know, comes together kind of late in the game. So hopefully another year will add to that knowledge base. Sounds good. 
Okay. All right, we'll forward that on for a regular item. and So we have public hearing. So. Public hearing on it. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, next up is the Bucer Street Closure and Alcohol Permit. Tyler Palmer is going to present. Gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is one that I think you may have started to become accustomed to seeing. This is uh, Boosters has uh, requested to have a beer and wine garden on Main Street. Um, this is uh, pursuant to the resolution that the uh, City Council has passed that, that will allow for beer and wine to be served in the public right-of-way when the event meets certain conditions. Um, this is an event that's been held now a few times under this new ordinance, and uh, we haven't really had any problems. We think that this is the kind of event that the ordinance was created for to allow this sort of thing to happen. Um, this has been passed through the police department, fire department, and public works, and we don't see any problems with this permit. So with that, I'll field any questions you might have. Well, this is about the third time this has been presented, and I haven't seen any problems with it in the past. Could probably I agree. put it on the consent agenda. Yeah. And this will have the same, I see Chief Duke had in here, you know, he had, didn't have a problem with it as long as it was the same uh, Manage identical to the 626 closure. So, as, is that what our resolution reflects? Yes. Chief, you want to elaborate? Thank you. Yeah, the street closure wasn't any issue. Uh, when we worked this last time, uh, there was an issue with the barriers, and we just asked that the vendor put up a little bit more sturdier barrier and then the ones, because the officers that worked had stated they could go in and out around it at any location and the whole point was to have one point of entry right. one point of exit so if that's taken care of i believe we should go forth but that was the only thing brought to my attention over yeah, during the last event and then i see yeah i, I saw in the application it was six to eleven but we have in the resolution the actual event is six to ten with tear down to be completed by eleven yeah. mm -hmm. And I think that was what we had before with the last one. Right. Yeah, we have the event. What, what, what we ask the applicants to do is to put the actual time of closure in the application because sometimes they'd be putting the time of event. Right. And then our staff who does the traffic control looks at it, and they see 6 to whenever, and that's when they're going to close it. And so we put the actual event times, the closure times rather than the event itself right. times. Okay. Guys, all right. We I'm good. forward that for approval. Okay. Senate agenda. That works for me. While you're up here, Tyler, that's the rest of that's the re, the bulk of our regular items. So we'll uh, have you and Rick give a city fleet report. That's right. Thank you. We you got pictures. We got some pictures. We're gonna make this fun, <laughs> as fun as fleet can be. We think that's fun. Um, this is uh, this is the second in our. Having to move my chair in the this is the second in our series of reports that, that we want to bring on the different divisions within our public works department. And it's just we, many of you will recall, we did the uh, wastewater conveyance department last month. Um, and so this month we wanted to talk a little bit about our fleet department. Um, fleet's kind of an invisible department a lot of times. It's one of those things that when you ask the layperson what a city does and what roles the city plays, fleet might not be the first thing to roll off somebody's tongue. But it's, it's an interesting department in that it touches everything else. It's one of two internal service funds in the city, along with IS, information systems. Um, and Fleet provides service to every department in the city and really plays a very critical role in what we do. Um, Rick's got a great presentation put together that I'll let him dive into here in a second. I'd just like to mention that there are a couple things that, that I think make the city of Moscow Fleet and Fleet Department special. We have a city that provides a lot of services. Due to our geographic isolation, there, there are things that the city of Moscow has to do that a lot of cities the size of Moscow don't have. You know, a lot of times they'll have regional wastewater treatment or regional water production. We, we really don't have that option here. Um, and also just the, the geographic isolation also means that there aren't dealers as close as, to us as there might be to someone who works in an area that in a more urban area like a Seattle or a Spokane. And so our guys really have to be really well versed in everything. I mean, they, they're fixing a weed whacker one day and a fire pumper truck the next. It's it's Is that it, fixed it, yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for parts. Uh, it, fix, fixing that's a continuous. Thing. <laughs> but that's and so it's it's uh, you know it just takes it takes very well versed, very experienced problem solving mechanics to do this. And then when you think about some of the tasks that they facilitate happening, these are emergency response tasks. These are. These are ambulances that they're keeping on the road, 
police vehicles, fire vehicles, snow plow equipment, and and uh, it's pretty impressive what these guys are able to do. So with that, I'll let you, Rick, run you guys through what they do. Afternoon, counselors. Good afternoon. This is uh, going to be a little talk on our shop at work. We are a maintenance facility. We are not intended to be an overhaul shop. We don't have the manpower or the shop space for major overhauls, but yet we do overhauls and equipment that have no local support, no local expertise, and if we have the tools and talent for the job. And usually when it comes to the specialized municipal equipment that we've got, we are the most familiar with it, job too. Um, we do a lot of PMs, a lot of, uh, we call them predicted service. We know we're going to be doing PMs on about everything that we've got, which is a, you could call it a service. Uh, we have different levels. The slide on the left shows the different levels that we have, different hourly checks that we make on certain pieces of equipment. It's all tracked by a computer program. I'd like to point out on that last slide the, the jack stands that you see there on the right hand side that was approved by the council in last year's budget and you can imagine trying to do these sorts of tasks without being able to lift that kind of equipment. This has been a pretty big luxury that we've really appreciated out of the shop. I will explain. We've, we've got a good slide here on those. Uh, we do new vehicle setup, police car builds, uh, we install and mount snow plows on small trucks, walkway installations on stainless steel standard, sanders, lighting. Uh, we will be installing a dump body here pretty soon on an F-550 for the water department. These are before pictures of a car as we get it from the dealer for a patrol vehicle. This is what we do to convert that vehicle to police service. There's a lot of disassembly, a lot of wiring, a lot of trying to keep the wiring straight. Uh, the slide on the left lower shows the uh, new howlers that we're putting on that low frequency siren that you sometimes hear going through town. Uh, this is a picture then of the finished product. The tray that you notice on the upper right is uh, imp simplified our processes immensely. The first couple of cars we did, we did it a different way and we, this is always a work in progress and we made some changes to expedite our procedures and that tray is what expedited things quickly. The upper left is the video system screen and the computer screen and the lower is our finished product. Uh, a front view of a plain car as it comes from the dealer and the lower picture is a car as it's completed in our shop. This is a picture of an Equinox that we outfit for the fire department as a command vehicle and it's also shared use with the engineering department as an inspector's vehicle. Uh, and we went through the procedure of same thing, we tore it pretty much apart and installed all the sirens, lighting and the equipment that's needed to make it be safe in a code run setting and allow the people to make code runs in. Um, we do end-of-life teardowns. We have a surplus vehicle and equipment management system that includes city auction, trade, sell to neighboring towns, or as this slide shows, salvage. This, this salvage has worked excellent for our police vehicles. We get a way better dollar return on salvaging those cars than we do in the $1,500 to $2,000 that we get on a trade. So we are actually saving about $5,000 per car in salvage, using salvage parts. And that also gives us uh, less downtime because the parts are right here handy and we don't have to pay freight. It's, I think this is a really good example of, of how creative Rick and his staff are as they look at these things. It's easy to get robotic with some of these things and just say, okay, it goes to auction. It's, 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 it's beyond its useful life. But they came a few years ago and said, hey, you know, we think we ought to keep one or two of these. And if this is all we're getting from auction, we can probably save more than that. And within about six months, we'd pulled $3,000 in parts off a car that we would have only gotten $1,200 out of. Didn't you actually lunch a rear end out of one of them and have yep. to get that? Both of those have Both of them. rear ends that have been swapped. Yep. And, and in instead of, you know, buying the parts, we just took the whole rear end out and put it in there and it, it was a much faster repair. So these guys are really creative. With their builds it's always fun when we get the vendors of the equipment they'll come out to the shop after they see a build that Rick and his staff have done and they're always just 
in awe of it. They sit there and take pictures and use them for examples for other people for how to do it. Uh, our technician skill set requirements are very broad from building police cars. Uh, I have two technicians that repair mowers to graders, compact pickups to fire trucks. And we have uh, assisted other departments with our skills, uh, most recently working with the operators at the treatment plant on a stubborn gearbox disassembly that uh, one of our guys went down and assisted with the disassembly. And it, it all worked really well to be able to uh, pool our talents together. Uh, we are challenged by new diesel engine emissions. I'm sure you've probably experienced the dreaded check engine light. Uh, we do have specialized municipal equipment that we have no local support on. And as Tyler said, our geographic isolation uh, in parts acquisition and service location is definitely makes things so that they are interesting at times. Uh, we do fabrication parts for specialized equipment. Uh, we try to be proactive at making things efficient to keep departments man power efficient. Uh, we do repairs. Uh, we, where did I go? <laughs> okay, well, I'm out of order here, so you'll have to bear with me as I get this all straightened around. Uh, here we go. No, that isn't right. Um, oh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> well, what we're seeing is the repairs that we make. We have, uh, oh, here we go. We, this is a broken leaf spring on a fire truck. Uh, we have a loader There's spindle. There's a laser pointer right here, Rick, so you can point it out. Oh, sweet. That top button right there. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> they okay. really do help each other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the loader spindle, uh, we had a failure there. Uh, that was a kind of a catastrophic failure. I talked about the emission systems on uh, new diesel engines. The upper right-hand picture here is a picture of the new emission diesel particulate filter that has created a very uh, interesting aspect in trying to keep equipment running. Uh, we uh, are moving on to our fabrication projects. Uh, we transferred this body, this is 1986, module that we transferred onto a 2010 Ford chassis. Uh, we made the body, oops. We made the body mounts here and here. Uh, we had a dual fuel tank system on the previous vehicle. The new vehicle only had a single tank, so we made the cover for it. Uh, all of the lighting was converted to LED from regular halogen or incandescent bulbs. Uh, we replaced the light bar on the front and there's a light bar on the rear with the new style uh, NFPA uh, approved light bar system which was over and above what the old system had. Uh, these are more fabrication products, projects. This is a uh, stencil rack that we made for our new stencil truck. This down here is also on the stencil truck. It holds cones. It holds uh, the flags that they put out. Uh, trying to fit all that into that pickup was a challenge. And to be able to haul all the stuff they needed without having to continue to make trips back and forth or haul a trailer, or, uh, this, this combined some resources into one. I think this is this is a great example of how, how fleet does more than just keeps the engines running for our city. You know we. We really run lean, and each year when Gary does the budget presentations, it's shown that you know we we do a lot with with fewer employees, and and one of the reasons we can is because we have guys like Rick and Mike and Carl working out of the shop who take something like this and make it so that what would be a three or four man operation can be a two man operation, what would be a two vehicle operation can be a one vehicle operation, because they get really creative and help us fabricate this sort of thing to to make sure we're maximizing our efficiency. So you went from that big flatbed to a, just a pickup now with all the sign paint. Yep. Stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and that pickup now is a dual-use vehicle because we can 
take the take the painting unit out and then we can put a sa a spreader in it we can put a plow on the front and so it gets used through the winter time instead of sitting all winter and having one two trucks to serve that purpose we now have one truck that we're able to do it with uh, we took this assembly right here this is a valve exerciser and this is a vacuum system that used to be mounted on two separate trailers and again, they were taking two vehicles to the job site. We took the stuff off the traders and mounted it on one truck. So now it's, it saves a vehicle at the job site or it saves having to make another trip. Uh, we've fabricated and remanufactured to uh, customize our installs for our snow plows and sanders. This particular unit here was bent and that was a method that might come up with with a chain and a jack and a pedestal to straighten that unit so that the plow was square to the ground again well, that's kind of unfortunate yeah manhole <laughs> manholes are as many railroad tracks at least now. Yeah. yeah yeah you hope you don't have a hot coffee when you do that <laughs> if you're right. driving the truck uh, we also are going to be taking a flatbed uh, dump body style flatbed like what's in that upper picture and we're going to be installing it on a vehicle for the water department in the near future. Uh, this is part of our seasoned equipment setup. Uh, we removed the dump body and we put the sanders on. Uh, we had tried mounting the sanders in the dump body. For our purposes it didn't work that well. The, the rock builds up on the bottom and it made it hard to keep it clean the rock was just building up and then it sit in there and freeze and it break the chain so it just made it more sense to take the bodies off so we customized all the mounts so that the process for taking the dump body off and installing the sander was expedited a lot uh, mike was very instrumental in doing all the customizing on them mounts and he made them so that we were able to uh, improve our time and another proactive approach we do for seasonal equipment is uh, all the fire trucks the rural fire trucks are brought in at the beginning of the season and the foam systems are gone through and clean disassembled flushed and cleaned before the truck goes out for their first fire hopefully if we get to it in time and uh, whatever repairs that we see that need to be made then we get it made before the fire season starts and that eliminated a whole bunch of our during fire season failures that we were having uh, luckily we have very little field repair but uh, we do field repairs as needed Carl's background being in the uh, uh, farm implement business and being a field mechanic for them uh, he's he does most of our field repairs we schedule yearly inspections of bucket trucks cranes for the wastewater treatment plant fire pumps for the fire department and ground ladder ladders and the aerial ladder uh, we write specs and we purchase vehicles uh, the two pages on the left are pictures of our spec sheets this year I wrote 53 pages of specs I've sent out 20 requests for quotes or bids I've sent out 20 acceptance letters written 20 POs and I've written more than 20 thanks for the quote bid letters the, for, the form, here we go, on the right is our vehicle equipment justification form that is sent out to the departments when we have a vehicle that comes up for replacement that's sent out and they write down what it is that they're expecting. There's a question on there about if you can combine uses, is this the best use for that vehicle and you know a lot of the ideas that we get come from the departments. The department will, will write down you know a, a thought about what we can do and we'll take that thought and we'll expand on it and, and we have uh, made several changes in how the fleet is oriented as far as what vehicles are used for what in trying to combine use and to uh, keep from having what's called as fleet creep fleet creep is uh, when you have a vehicle replaced but you don't get rid of it you just keep it and you add and you add and pretty soon you just can't keep up so this assists us with getting rid of fleet creep uh, we have had past issues with 
our vehicles that have been spec'd. We now have pre-build meetings with the waiting bidders. The pre-build meetings make sure the bid's understood, the specs are understood. Uh, we have a pre-paint inspection that's done so that any problems that we see is done before it's painted. It's done before the vehicle gets down here. It creates this big hassle. You have to take it back up, and then we don't have the vehicle. So those have expedited our processes. Um, I look for ways to combine use. You know, some of the examples are we combine the fire and electrical inspector vehicle. Uh, sanitation is now sharing an engineering vehicle instead of them having their own special vehicle. Community development downsized uh, from four to four two. To two. So we had two vehicles that went out of the fleet. Uh, we have the paint truck in the summer, the snow plow and salter in the winter. And the street and water department are now going to swap trucks for winter operations. We have a tandem axle truck that is going to be uh, purpose for both departments instead of having just purpose for one department. I think a lot of what Rick is, is getting at here too is that you know fleet is we're trying to we don't want to stagnate and we don't want to do things just because we've always done them that way. We try and think about what's the need and what can we do to best meet that need and how we can how we can do that most efficiently. And sometimes that's cross departments and we have to break down those stove pipes that that can exist between departments. And sometimes it's just rethinking what we might need or how we might do a job. And we've gotten a lot of cooperation from the departments within the city helping us work toward doing that. Um, and fleet, we have a vested interest in all these efficiencies so that we can save time and we share a common goal with all you guys that we do definitely want to spend our money wisely. Now, there are things we outsource. We outsource front end alignment, we outsource radiator builds, windshields, body repair. Uh, very rare do we have any transmission trouble, but uh, we do outsource transmission overhauls if need be. We outsource truck and equipment tires. Uh, certain kinds of engine rebuilding, special machining, uh, like cylinder heads, lathe work, uh, specialized graphics in police, fire, van pool, etc., and towing. And some of the f criteria we use are uh, special skills, special tools. Uh, some jobs people have more familiarity than we do. You know, a lot of body shop work we just aren't familiar with that. Uh, we uh, also have a issue with space. Uh, our shop fills up real fast. And we, a lot of times, have some operational dysfunction because of the facility size and layout. And I mean, it takes so much time to be able to have to tow a rig out and then to push it back in, to tow another rig out and push it back in, that it just, it doesn't, my time can be, our time can be better constructed with using other methods than just trying to get it in and out of the shop. And we do work outside some, but that isn't very efficient either. Uh, manpower and workload also is a, is a uh, uh, implement that we use to decide. Uh, to work efficiently, we use a CFA, Computerized Fleet Management Asset Program. It tracks and monitors mileage for PM intervals. It tracks and monitors fuel, uh, fuel usage. It stores vital ID numbers for components, and it stores part numbers. Uh, the jacks, these jacks are incredible. Carl has become our jack user, our jack expert. That vehicle right there, the sweeper, to get that up and work on the sweeping mechanism underneath, it, you can't lift them. You just can't get a jack in there lifting. There's too much mechanism underneath that truck. So being able to lift it that way and get under there has incredibly increased our uh, time usage. It used to take us two days, two people, to change the curtains on a different street sweeper than that one. And now one person can do it in about a half to three quarters of a day. So the time that we're going to save with these jacks is huge. And now that we have the floor fixed in the shop, we'll be able to lift this equipment in the shop, although can't get it as high maybe as what we need it, <laughs> but uh, to be able to do it in the shop with the floor being currently fixed is huge for us. Uh, check sheets uh, saves time and it also ensures we don't forget anything. So we have accident check sheets, new vehicle, delete vehicle, and vehicle and equipment replacement check sheets. 
And I can I can cover this real quick if you want, Rick. Up we, we you guys are pretty familiar with this, and so we can score a lot of this. We 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 didn't have a comprehensive driver training program, so we implemented our Eco Driver program, which is all incoming employees are trained in the program, um, and it covers everything from how we expect people to fuel, how we expect people to drive, seat belt usage, all that kind of stuff. And it's really just a comprehensive program that way. And included within that is our low use review. And so I think, next slide, the low use review is something that we do once every three years. And that's when we go through our fleet and we say, hey, what's, we, we set thresholds for use. And what, what's, whatever's not being used to that threshold, we take a look at. Some of them are things that are necessary. They're just, by their nature, they need to be there, but they don't get used a lot. Um, but some of the through this through the use of this list, we have eliminated several units from the fleet. A good example is this year in the budget that you've recently looked at, we are proposing taking two parks tractors and combining them into one unit because they both were getting lower use, and we realized that if we took those two, got the right implements for one, we could have one unit. And so that's the value in something like this. It's it doesn't make us the most popular all the time when we come and tell people, hey, we don't think you need that. <laughs> but but by and large. The departments have been great working with us and, you know, really coming up with, like Rick said, they're the ones that typically come up with the creative solutions and say, hey, you know, maybe we can do this differently. Uh, we have a parts management system. We don't try to stock that many parts, but because of the critical equipment that we have, being snow plows, ambulances, fire trucks, sweepers, uh, you just can't get parts for those in a timely manner without paying huge amounts of freight. So we do stock parts. We are rebuilding shelves now to currently try to rearrange our parts storage area. Um, I'm working on setting up a parts acquisition system from our local vendors so that I can look up parts and see what they have on their shelves. It's going to save me phone call. I can do competitive uh, pricing by just looking up through their systems. And uh, it, it all does, it works much faster. Uh, it's also a uh, work in progress. You know, it, it, it doesn't always work as I want it to, but uh, we are trying to, to do that. Uh, this is our replacement schedule. Uh, Les McDonald worked really hard on making a uh, replacement schedule that was, you know, this looks very, it's very entailed. It looks more complicated than it really is. Uh, it makes sure that we keep our fleet updated to the most efficient vehicles. It helps us to ensure parts acquisition instead of having parts obsolescence. It keeps the fleet updated to safe, safer technology, and it gives us less time-consuming vehicle life repair. So the total life of the vehicle, we get rid of it before we start. Then had to put stop size in for floorboards. Uh, we don't want to recycle them out too soon because then we spend all of our time setting up new vehicles. But yet, we're trying to, you know, we work on it every year and we readjust vehicles trying to get that fine line to where they're just right. We really try and hone in on that sweet spot where we get the most bang out of the initial purchase of the vehicle without the maintenance cost increasing to the point that it doesn't make sense anymore. So the number one question I get is how many vehicles do you have? And that's always a fluid answer. It varies monthly. We get rid of things. We, we keep things, we absorb things. Right now our fleet totals are the police has 31, the city fire has 20, the rural fire has 12, volunteer ambulance is 9, water and sewer has 48, street is 39, parks has 43, engineering is 5, community development has 2, the van pool has 3, fleet has 3, and IS has 1. So that's a conservative total of 216. And by conservative, I mean we, I'm not including the sub assets. So we've got a dump truck that also has a sander and a snow plow. That's all considered one. It used to be that we had the sanders separate from the plows, and, and we don't do that anymore. Uh, attachments for the tractors are now part of the tractor. Attachments for the skid steer are now going to be part of the skid steer instead of having individual numbers for everything. If, if a sub asset is able to be used on multiple pieces of equipment, then it gets a number. But if it's used on that same equipment, then we, we, we don't have uh, those extra numbers. So that's why it's a conservative total. Uh, in, in the most important part, in my opinion, of all this is we've got a wonderful crew. Tammy is our administrative assistant, and she keeps us going strong. She, she is amazing she's what the, she'll do for us. She's the glue that holds the place together. Yep.
and we have two extraordinary technicians and I I can't say that any stronger these guys have amazing talent the uh, meetings and training and all the stuff that we go to one of the big concerns topics is people say how do you find I mean you just can't find good technicians and they've got problems and they can't get along and and they're they're saying that they're trained and they're not and, and the problems just mount and mount and we our technicians are incredible our fabrication skills our training or not our training but our uh, our uh, methods that we do are because of these guys right here and we have wonderful people and we might not be a visible frontline entity in what we do but I feel that we're vital to the success of the city success of the city and if you go to all the departments and you ask them ask them if they could do their job without us and I bet you there's not a one that would say that they could when you know, I'd, I'd just like to echo what Rick said you know these I, I've never been around a more committed dedicated group than Rick's group you know they really are committed to saving the city money and doing a good job and we thank you guys for taking a minute and letting you letting us tell you about our fleet department sorry it took so long no, that's all right I just have Thanks, one Rick. question which uh, which one of the four of you uh, get to tell the uh, police officers that uh, you're going to be taking those dents and dings out of the cars when they were driving them out of their paychecks. <laughs> Every time they bring one in. Right? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, next up is a Southeast Moscow Water and Sewer District contract status. Thank you. I don't see less, so you must be going to tell us, Gary. I, I am going to tell you what little I know. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Lois Pritchett, the uh, president of the um, sewer district for being here as well I was just <coughs> you know this is a contract that's been extended through September 30th 2015 uh, it was extended I believe last November uh, the direction to staff was to do an analysis and make a recommendation to City Council on whether um, the assets of the district should be taken over by the city the city then would run essentially the sewer district out there and uh, the pros and cons for doing that the city now as you know already provides the service and uh, maintenance major maintenance is something that uh, major failure the sewer district is responsible for but we maintain uh, the assets of the district at this time we've also had uh, annexations uh, to the north of highway 8 which are uh, some of them flow through district assets to get back to the city's sewer system and the request came from the district back in 2007 as to whether or not the city would want to take over the assets of the system and the sewer district could cease to function there are complications with that uh, which prompted us to prompted the council back in 2007 2008 uh, to say we're not interested in doing it now at that time we made the offer of uh, or at least we discussed annexation of the properties within the district which would then make that a part of the city uh, district patrons weren't uh, excited about that shall we say uh, and at that time uh, council just indicated that we weren't interested in in taking over the district at that time about a year ago the discussion came up again maybe a year and a half ago uh, so staff has done less has done a bunch of research on it just gave us the documentation a little over a week ago maybe two weeks uh, legal is reviewing it engineering and myself uh, and I believe finances as well so Les is out this week when he gets back next week we'll sit down confab on it and come back to you I believe it's on the 24th is the next uh, administrative public works finance committee so at that point we will be uh, making a recommendation or at least a staff perspective asking the council to give us some direction um, obviously Lois and the district want to know what direction we're taking if it's going to be done with an agreement then uh, we've already had an agreement drafted uh, in anticipation of the decision last uh, fall uh, so what we're looking at now is to bring you as much information as possible as soon as the final draft is completed we'll provide a copy to Lois in the district as well so they can analyze it as well so just wanted to let you know where it was at we know the uh, date is impending and we want to give you a, uh, 
enough time to make a decision prior to uh, the 30th of September. So that's my report. Okay. I've got any questions? Does Lois have anything she'd like to add? Would you like to add anything, Lois? No, Okay. <laughs> so somebody else. <clears throat> Another district is waiting as well. So. There you go. Uh, anything else for the good of the order? Uh, nothing, sir. All right. We'll that's consider it. ourselves adjourned. Thanks, everybody.